Coming up on Market to Market. A weakening El Nino drops a menagerie of moisture across the country. More money is diverted to help quench a burning issue. And refugee farmers put roots down in their new home. Those stories and market analysis with Elaine Cub next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, December 25 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. The holiday weekend was preceded by inclement weather and hopes of a Santa Claus market bounce. According to the Commerce Department, new home sales appeared to rise 4.3 percent last month. However, that number masks a sharp downturn in October, which made the large jump possible. Overall, sales are up 14.5 percent for the year. Orders for durable goods were flat last month. And when big-ticket items like airplanes are pulled from the equation, orders declined one-tenth of one percent. Oil prices hit 11-year lows early in the week. Despite suffering from oversupply, crude got some traction and rebounded by Thursday's close. And AAA reported gasoline briefly fell below $2, a nine-year low, as holiday travel began. But prices crawled above the threshold by the time you got to Grandma's house. While the drive to be with friends and family this holiday weekend will be less expensive, Mother Nature had a few things to say about the ease of that journey. A diminishing El Nino weather pattern brought snow to the mountains and rain to the plains as winter rolled into full swing. Rain and not snow plagued much of the lower Midwest to kick off the week, but snow eventually covered much of the region. Farther south, tornadoes killed seven and injured more than 40 as the week came to a close. The excess moisture has helped reduce the fire danger out west. As the Forest Service struggles to pay the bill for this year's fire season, next year will be decidedly different. The U.S. Forest Service spent a record $1.7 billion this year combating wildfires that burned 15,000 square miles nationwide making 2015 the costliest fire season in American history. The agency, which operates under the USDA banner, spent more than half its total budget on firefighting for the first time ever, depleting funds last August. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack vowed to end the practice of rating other programs' funding to cover annual costs, and in a letter to lawmakers last week, called on Congress to step in with emergency funding in 2016, saying, the American public can no longer afford delays to forest restoration and other critical forest service activities caused by annual fire transfers. According to the Senate Appropriations Committee, expenditures for wildland fire management will top the 10-year average by $593 million. And while the price tag has put the government in the red six of the past 10 years, the new federal budget boosts wildfire resources to $1.6 billion in 2016, but still short of amounts dropped beating back flames this year. A lot of people see it as an adrenaline rush. Anticipating considerable deficits, forestry officials have held back on programs not directly related to firefighting like maintenance and restoration on hundreds of millions of acres across the U.S. Fire in general is, is really good for forests. That's why prescribed fire is important to the management of the lands here, is that we help reduce that fuel loading so that when we do have the wildfire, we have less fuel. Situated in what has been called the largest hand-planted forest in the world, Central Nebraska's Bessie Ranger District comprises 22,000 trees on 90,000 acres. Foresters at the Bessie Nursery 
one of a handful of sites across the country tasked with replenishing the nation's woodlands, tend 50 sapling varieties on 76 acres within Nebraska National Forest. Every ranger district has to have a 10-year seed plan, and so they have to have so much seed stored just in case they have a catastrophe, such as wildfire, a blowdown event, bark beetle, spruce beetle, whatever it might be. While the Cornhusker state may seem an unlikely fit to restock the foliage of surrounding states, the sandy soil and easy access to irrigation are ideal for nursery managers. For a bare root crop, you can get seedlings out of here very easily. If this was a heavy clay, it would stick to the roots and tear the roots off when we try to extract them. While USDA has diverted large amounts of capital for air tankers and personnel, officials say the line in the sand means it is the responsibility of Congress to ensure sufficient resources are available from now on. The Obama administration has been pursuing a long-term fix by tailoring wildfire responses similar to other types of disaster relief like hurricanes and tornadoes. However, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee rejected the idea, saying more review is needed to ensure the firefighting process would work as intended. According to the nonpartisan National Conference of State Legislators, the federal government spent $1.5 billion on the 70,000 refugees who entered the country in 2015. Many are fleeing war-torn parts of the world, seeking out the U.S. as a place to put down roots. Recently, at least 30 states were less welcoming to Syrian refugees, but this is the exception rather than the rule. There is a rich history of Midwesterners opening their doors to the recently arrived. Many of the new Americans have a connection to the land, and for one refugee, the opportunities for her, her bounty appear almost boundless. Paul Yeager explains. Angelique Hakuzamana is happiest in a farm field, a location that's halfway around the world from her native war-torn land. This one quarter acre is in her new home of Iowa. But getting here was a long journey from Rwanda. She left her family and came alone to the United States in 2009. Hakuzamana knew agriculture, She'd learned about the importance of hard work from her father, who managed a coffee plantation. But once in the States, Hakuzamana realized she was a long way from home. My hand needed to do work. I needed to do the same my job me doing in Africa. So I'm crying to do so now. Jesus gave it to me. I'm happy because I have got it now. So. This is how you test your pH. This classroom is full of refugees from around the world. They are in an incubator program called Global Greens, operated by Lutheran Services in Iowa, or LSI. People that we work with are people who have literally lost their land um, and a lot of other things. There are people who are very connected to where they lived um, agriculturally, but had that taken away from them and living in refugee camps. Very small space, there's no um, not much room for agriculture and much else, and so this is just an opportunity to give them so much um, kind of healing in that way, and it's also producing great food. Even though many in this room have a farming background, the Iowa soil is different than what they're used to. Your grass. To get a better feel for the new ground that they're breaking, this group of farmers is taking classes that focus on planting and preparation for the growing season ahead. So if you have a really long stem, if you plant that outside, the wind's going to blow it over and it's going to break. 160 refugee families across Iowa are engaged in some form of farming under the social services program. Some have plots big enough to feed their family. Others have taken the next step and are growing enough food to sell on the open market. They love growing the food. They can do that really well, but then it's like, OK, where do, what, what do I do with this? And how to do that in an efficient way that's going to make them the most money for their work, too. Therein lies the next challenge, understanding and operating in the American free market. Part of the education program of Global Greens is finding a market that goes beyond selling tomatoes and peppers to include more unique produce. Officials at LSI hope to open a new path for farmers 
by selling directly to restaurants. And timing couldn't be better for the program as the locally sourced food movement gains traction. It kind of goes hand in hand with each other because it's people who often don't even have a concept for local food because that's what, that's what food was. So we're kind of trying to go back a little bit in those ideas and we're really trying to help them understand their place in the local food system and I think even kind of get a feel for how important what they're doing is. Tracks of land are set up all over the capital city of Des Moines, some in neighborhoods, the largest near a community center. Whichever one you think is better. LSI set up this farmer's market in a neighborhood not far from their plots. This small-scale approach acts as a training ground for these growers. Some of the produce is exotic and may have a potential for higher return for the grower. For a lot of them, it's just they love doing it. That's where they feel kind of at home and um, reminds them of their home. From the farm to the market, those involved are grateful for the opportunity. Farmers are known as dreamers. Hakuzamana is no different. My favorite is garden. It's, it's the way you me, be me walk outside, you know me. So the garden in now me have is small. I need a big form. Hakuzamana was approved for only one of eight one-quarter acre gardens and balances working the larger plot with her job as a custodian at a local church. There are other programs like this around the country, so the sharing of ideas is easy for organizers. But getting your own plot of land is not. Global Greens has a waiting list. So every year we're trying to find new sites for around Des Moines, at least for community gardens, and then always having people who want more land, so we're always searching for larger spots. Good food, healthy people, healthy Once in the program, the commitment for producers is substantial. Farmers of the larger plots have to arrange transportation to their land by either driving themselves or taking the bus. But beyond the fields of opportunity today is the lesson of putting something away for tomorrow. And we've actually been able to pair them with Practical Farmers of Iowa with that organization. They've been really supportive um, and all eight of our farmers are enrolled in their savings incentive program. So it's a program where over two years they create a business plan, get to meet with a farm mentor who kind of has a similar business as theirs or their goals, um, and then there's a savings match. So they're, they're putting a little bit into savings every year or every month, and then after two years for the amount, um, it's a little over $2,000. If they've saved, they'll match that money, which is great for them. In two years, they'll be ready to go to at least invest in some infrastructure or part of their land. Global Greens provided the opportunity to get Hakuzamana back into the field. Now the refugee is closer to realizing the American farmer's dream of owning her own land. Now I'm working, now I have a garden, I'm doing food. I can plant the seeds, it's little, little, little seeds like this. Me putting the brown, it's come big. Everything come big, everything come big. Oh man, yeah, so that is my favorite. My job is, is a garden. For market to market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. The commodity markets closed early this week due to the Christmas holiday. There were gifts of sorts for the livestock sector, but the grain markets received the equivalent of a lump of coal. For the holiday shortened week, March wheat fell 19 cents and the nearby corn contract declined a dime. Scattered showers in Brazil's soybean belt took the wind out of the market as the March contract lost 20 cents. January meal suffered the same fate, falling 11.70 per ton. In the softs, cotton was flat as the March contract gave up 3 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class 3 milk futures dropped 32 cents. The livestock sector received a holiday gift as the February cattle contract rose 11.50, March feeders jumped 11.38, and the February lean hog contract moved $1.67 higher. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index lost ground, falling 7 tenths of 1%. February crude rose 204 per barrel. Comex gold gained 10.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index gained back all of last week's losses to settle at 314.60. 
Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Elaine Cub. Elaine, welcome back. Merry Christmas, Mike. Merry Christmas, Elaine, and we're excited to have you. We've got exciting things happening in the livestock world. Absolutely. Less exciting things happening in the grain world. And this is not just Christmas season for a lot of folks, longtime Seinfeld viewers. It's also Festivus season. And we've got a question here from Glenn Newcomer. He's sent this to us on Twitter. You can find us at Market to Market. He says, if Festivus allows for the airing of the grievances, what would your main concern be with the markets? And let's talk grain markets, Elaine. Airing of grievances, and this is this is not only the grain markets because I'm going to pick the U.S. dollar. You know, I, I think I've said on this program back, you know, years ago that Ben Bernanke was the farmer's best friend with that easy money that was coming into the economy. And I wouldn't say that Janet Yellen is an enemy to the farmer, but she's not doing anything special to help U.S. or she and the Federal Reserve. Let's just not make this personal. Is not doing anything special to help U.S. producers of any sort of commodity or any sort of manufactured good. Um, by raising interest rates, we have a strong dollar, and it's not that it's unfair. I mean, we had many years uh, of very cheap money. So, um, but that's, I mean, that's the thing that's going to be the strongest headwind and the, and the biggest challenge for us competing on export markets for grains in 2016. Now, speaking of that, we did have phenomenal export sales pretty well across the board here announced on Thursday of this week. Uh, let's talk about the wheat market. We saw fairly good wheat sales. Wheat's still off 20 cents on the week. Where are we going to find some good news in this wheat market? Not from me. I, I don't have anything great to tell you. The the So going back to the currency problem, Russia's currency fell by 6% this week. The Ukrainian Hryvnia fell 3% this week. They are not, you know, at this point we're not as concerned about their weather situation as we were even a few weeks ago because they're going into dormancy and it's, you know, it's like being worried about Kansas wheat at this point. It's just hard to get worried about wheat north hemisphere wheat in December or January. So there's not a lot of bullish bullish news. Um, and the rest of the world market is going to continue to look to that Black Sea region when they're going to look at buying wheat in 2016, not only from the currency standpoint, from, from the geography standpoint. So, you know, the U.S. wheat market does not have a lot of great news. So where does the producer with that winter wheat in the ground and Excellent conditions so far this year mm -hmm. for it. Looks like it should be good yields, and we've got a long way to go till harvest. Where do you hedge that crop in this market that just is relentlessly dropping? Well, I think you shouldn't go out of your way to hedge it right now just because it, along with, I mean, it has shown that it will follow corn where corn goes. And so all of this feed grain market will continue to wiggle up and down. And so you, you might get your usual spring rally in the row crop markets, and to some extent it might drag a little bit wheat higher there. Um, you know, that's about all you can hope for. Wheat doesn't have any really strong seasonal tendency that, that I'm going to tell you a date that this is the high, high okay. that you should sell on, so I, I don't really know. And there's no price levels out there to really keep an eye on, as volatile as it's been. No, and and there is the concern that the dollar will keep going higher. I mean, if you, you could hedge from that standpoint, but I think I would wait until you got a little bit of a rally. Okay, well, let's talk the corn market. Down a dime here on this old crop corn. Uh, we're anticipating or have been anticipating farmers to start making sales here in January. Uh, is that going to tear basis apart, Elaine Cup? Well, basis is very strong. I mean, this is very unseasonally strong. The nationwide average basis is about 25 under. And if you look out at the commercial basis bids into the March time frame, they're not expecting at this point yet to all of a sudden receive a lot of grain. Those, those bids remain strong all through the spring as the bid sheets are written today. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll see what happens when the new year comes. Typically, we do see a lot of farmers selling right out the new year. However, this year, you know, if they haven't needed the cash already, they may continue to, to do this hoarding. I mean, we don't want to call it hoarding, but they're being stubborn in a way that has influenced the basis and the futures spreads. The commercial market is really needing to, to ask for this grain eagerly. So farmers probably just keep it in the bin and meter it out as cash flow is required? That's what I think is going to happen. I think this will be an unusual year in January where we might not see a sudden crush of grain coming on to the market. Okay. Are you excited about selling new crop 16 corn at these price levels? Or are you going to wait for a spring rally? I would wait for some kind of a rally, but I would put my orders in and, and, and not be shy about it. You know, if you know what your profitability level is, I don't think that this year we don't, you know, we're not at this point going to expect to see a lot of help from South American weather. I think that that argument is, is not really playing out in the six to 10 day forecast. They're receiving some showers for their soybean market, for instance. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to help us 
we're probably going to create a big crop here in the United States unless we see El Nino switch over to La Nina. Something like that could happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So I would not be shy about making seasonal sales and putting the orders in and, and, and not waiting. Being aggressive. Yeah. All right. Well, now let's talk soybeans. Huge sale of soybeans to China reported this week didn't do any favors to the market. Are, is the rain in Brazil enough to overpower stronger demand news than we've seen in the past couple weeks? Possibly. I mean, the question is, what, what was going on last week? Was last week's rally a weather rally, or was that this, this export business coming in, you know, a, a little early? So, yeah, to the extent that anybody was, was worried about the dry weather going into the flowering of the Brazilian soybean crop, the 6 to 10-day forecast now shows some scattered showers from Mato Grosso, so... At this point, no. I mean, we can't get really bullish about, about that piece of the weather yet. Okay. 873, so old crop beans, uh, 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 March beans closed. Farmers who put beans in the bin, what do you do? Continue to meter out sales as in corn? Yeah, I mean, at, at this point, if you have, like I said, if you haven't needed cash already, you can probably make it, you know, I don't, I don't know what anybody's individual situation is. But, uh, yeah, I think that you might, you should have a goal in mind and probably expect to see the market wiggle, you know, up, down 40, 50 cents, and, and hopefully hit somewhere that's reasonable to you. $9 in the cards on the board? That's Yeah, I think that that is very reasonable, and particularly looking at 2016 sales, if you're going to look at, at pre-hedging next year's harvest, I think it's reasonable to wait and look for maybe a $9 cash level, but if you're profitable somewhere above or below that, that's just sort of a round number that's easy to say on a TV show, but you probably have a number that makes more sense for your operation. Okay, but sell when you hit that number. Yes, yes, sir. All right, well, now let's jump into the livestock. Let's get some good news yeah. to those cattle and pork producers who have been waiting quite a while for some good news. 1150 higher, live cattle, cash bids much stronger. Talk to us about what's driving this market, Elaine. It is cash led. So uh, the, the, the wholesale beef market was higher this week. The dressed box business was up, two, it was $200 this week. That was a $16 raise. So I don't believe that I've been on this show when we had a week where the business goes up $16 in a week. So this is very good news for the market, and it is good that it is being led by actual physical business. So this is not simply a matter of somebody hitting some stops in the futures market or or rearranging their portfolio here at the end of the year. This was a legitimate um, drive to get their hands on more animals, to fill up the feedlots. Th this is real, real bullish news. Now, since it was cash-led, and we did see some cattle change hands this week, what should we anticipate for the coming week? I think, you know, so we've already taken out, for, pretend that December never happened. All of those December doldrums, we've gone right through them in a matter of five days. You know, those were five straight sessions of higher prices. This was an incredible little rally here. Um, and I think it could continue just because this need for the actual physical animals, the packers are still going to need the animals and the feedlots are still going to want to put calves into the feedlots. So I think it could continue here for a little bit, whether it will continue at this pace, probably not. I limit, guess. limit, limit, yeah, almost limit, limit. That's hard yeah. to sustain. But I think that we will continue to see this eagerness to get your hands on, on cash supply. So at this level, given where we're sitting today, are you excited about putting some hedges on? Now that we're getting close for, for some producers, closer anyhow, to a break even, or do you let this thing play out a little while? I mean, I, I think the, the, the estimates that I've seen is we'd need a couple more weeks of $15 or $16 gains before we really hit break even. But maybe somebody can make it work, yeah, um, especially w with the grain prices remaining, you know, very unexciting. So it's a possibility to really be looking long and hard at it, yeah. Okay, well, now let's talk the feeder cattle market. W incredible rally this week. Coming on the heels of, of reports, looking at formulas, some feed yards with unhedged cattle d losing $700 a head. Mm -hmm. Can we expect that feeder market to sustain its rally with those cattle producers now looking to buy? They are looking to buy, even even at the projections that they have. And yes, absolutely, the feeder, the price that they pay for the calves is the biggest portion of that. It's it's not the feed is not the problem this year. It's just the the you know the power that the the uh, cow calf operations have and to demand these prices and and that again also was cash led this this week we saw basis turning positive in the in the feeder calf market we saw you know 163 on the futures but 650 pound calves traded at 180 in Valentine, Nebraska this week. So there are real willingness to pay these prices for those animals. True feeder, uh, yep. cattle feeder demand in yep. the country. All right. Well, now let's talk the hog market. Uh, we've been in, dropped out of a range last week, up $1.67 this week. Are we finding some support here? How does it look for the lean hog market? I think this week's gain in the hog market was 
spill over from the cattle market because the hog market itself really experienced bearish news this week with the hogs and pigs report it was large it wasn't super surprising i don't think it took the market by surprise 68.3 million head 101 percent so it wasn't wildly out of the range but it demonstrated that we have shaken off all of 2014's problems the pigs per litter number was higher so everything is back on trend so the hog market itself had bearish news not wildly bearish news not anything that we need to be really worried about going into the first quarter of 2016 but this week's gains were kind of a fluke, I think. So how long do you think this fluke can continue? Is it solely reliant on how long can this cattle market continue to run? Yeah, especially here at the end of the year like this, where you do have lower volumes of futures trade, where you do have funds that are moving in and out and, and, and balancing things at the end of the year. I, yeah, I don't know that, that the hog market could rely on higher prices again if we don't continue to see these triple digit days for the for the cattle. So how far out would you like to see if you were a pork producer hedging on this rally? Well, I mean, this isn't, I mean, this is hardly, I mean, this isn't enough of rally to get really excited okay. about, but but certainly they should be looking all the way through the first quarter of 2016 because the implied stocking levels will suggest that there's going to continue to be large numbers, large, large slaughters of hogs, that, and, and there's not going to be a lot of great bullishness down the line. You might as well take what opportunities you have here, yes. All right, well, Elaine Cub, thank you so much for joining us this week. It's been my pleasure. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market, but Elaine and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. You can check out links to our social media channels when you arrive. And we encourage you to email us with comments at markettomarket at iptv.org. And join us again next time when we'll look at the issues and outcomes of the past year. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Happy holidays and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.